Okay, good. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Julie Roth, and I am a senior energy analyst at the Office of Sustainability and Innovations. And you are at the GLREA's Ann Arbor Solar Stories monthly meeting. Um, as I was just saying, I'm on the phone because I'm out of town in, in a remote area. So apologies for any glitches at today's meeting, but John is my ever capable backup today. Um, so we have a very special guest today, Emil Lozano um, from the Ann Arbor Public Schools. I'm so excited to hear about everything that he has to say about uh, what the Ann Arbor Public Schools are doing in regards to solar, but also other electrification and sustainability initiatives. Um, and I do need to thank the sponsors for these meetings. And I'm gonna see if I can do this off the top of my head. Uh, we have Harvest Solar, we have Homeland Solar, we have McNaught McKay, and Iron Ridge Racking, and Eagle. Did I do it? I think that's all of them, <laughs> since I don't have a computer and only my phone. Very proud of that. Um, and I think that's it. So we're going to uh, hand it over to Emil. He's going to talk for a bit and then open it up for uh, questions and answers. If you are not on mute right now, if you could mute yourself and um, then unmute at the Q&A portion, that would be great. All right, well, thank you, Julie. Um, I'm really pleased to be here and I really appreciate uh, John and Julie and the Great Lakes Renewable Energy Association kind of keeping the fire going here over all these many years. Um, I think when I first met John, uh, commercial solar was probably going in at about $12 a watt. Um, back in the day, and we were trying to figure out how to how to do a little bit better than that. And I'm glad to say we're seeing uh, two and under these days, which is really awesome. Um, so uh, I'll just kind of get going. This is just our overview. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our other sustainability efforts because we really have we're in the midst of developing a, a environmentally environmental sustainability framework that will be coming to the public and our board here in the next really in the next month or so. And so we've been thinking deeply about what have we been doing at Ann Arbor Public Schools, trying to kind of capture that, and then think about how do we take the, all that work to the next level. Um, so we'll be talk, I'll talk a little bit about just background stuff. And then our, we, we're looking at energy in four categories, uh, efficiency and conservation, on-site renewables, on-site natural gas, and purchased electricity. Those are kind of our four energy buckets to um, really kind of get at our scope scope one and scope two emissions. Uh, water, we'll talk about that a little bit. Our waste reduction work, uh, transportation, uh, scope three emissions. That's really, uh, in my mind, that's kind of like the elephant in the room nobody likes to talk about, but it's a significant part of this work. And uh, a lot of work that we've been doing with our outdoor um, environment. So I'll just kind of basic overview uh, about 17,000 students and about 2,000 staff plus uh, quite a bit of contracted workforce. Um, we cover a big geographic area. We have 35 buildings, three and a half million square feet and about 723 acres of land. We are, people don't always realize, we encompass the entire city of Ann Arbor and portions of eight surrounding uh, townships covering 125 square miles. In late of 2018, the board adopted a new policy. We started a whole new policy series, the 8000 series, environmental sustainability. And we recognize that climate change is real, increasing and caused by human activity. That just kind of needed to be said, just in case anybody had any doubt about that. Um, and we recognize our community is also committed to doing better in these areas and that we have a responsibility to act. Um, as a primary educational institution for our K through 12 students uh, in the community, we recognize that environmental sustainability education is amongst all of our peer institutions and other institutions in the in the county. That's that's our sweet spot. If we're going to contribute one thing to this, you know, climate action, it's how we educate our students, and we wanted to recognize that, and also develop student leadership. Um, and the more classic sustainability work, you know, how we manage and operate our buildings and grounds, right? How do we conserve in our operations, in our construction, et cetera? 
and to uh, build upon and, and create new partnerships in this work. So that was adopted basically at the end of 2018, and we'll be adding policy under this 8000 series in the years ahead. Uh, we also passed a very significant bond in 2019. It was the second largest bond ever in the state of Michigan, a $1 billion bond. I mean, it was the largest bond by far per capita that's ever been passed in the state of Michigan. Uh, it equates to about $55,000 per student. Um, one of the cornerstones, these are the four cornerstones of that bond millage was environmental sustainability and uh, creating resilient schools for climate change. And a big part of that section is recognizing that environmental factors impact student productivity, health and well-being, cognitive function, a whole lot of other things. So student health impacts student thinking and ultimately student performance. And we recognize that in that section of the bond uh, campaign and commitments. And that really comes down to this graphic, um, how students hear, how they breathe, how they see and how they feel in a thermal environment all impact how they um, think and learn. And so that's a big part of our work as we are renovating our, our school buildings. And this is just a summary of the commitments that were made in that subsection. Uh, it's broken down into key themes and then the infrastructure that supports those themes. And I'm not gonna read this and I'll share this presentation with John and Julie, they can send it around to you guys, but. You know, this first one, creating optimized learning environments based on be best practice and research to utilize natural and artificial light, ensure fresh air quality free from pollutants, maintain classroom temperatures, optimize acoustics, all for improved cognitive function and productivity. There's a lot of science behind all of this now. Um, you know, 10, 20 years ago, people kind of anecdotally thought that these things mattered, but now we have a lot of research to prove that air quality, um, oxygen levels, thermal comfort, acoustical quality, all of that really does matter. Um, so getting into the energy and efficiency and conservation space, uh, we are doing a lot of LED lighting retrofits. And um, there is a big connection between the quality of the lighting environment and uh, both reading comprehension and performance, uh, task performance. And you'll see here, this is just a, a two worksheets. The one on the left is simulating an optimal learning environment. And the one on the right is a substandard learning environment. And they've done tests where they'll take, you know, 100 kids and put 50 over here and 50 over there, and they'll give them the same worksheet. And they will, they can prove that in this optimized learning environment, the students are actually reading and comprehending quicker and better than in the suboptimal environment. So while we're saving energy and we're reducing our carbon footprint with LED lighting, we're also focusing on these factors and providing things like dimming and control for teachers that they so they can also modulate the mood in a classroom. Um, one of the things we have right now is just a lot of on-off situations in our classrooms. Um, and with dimming, and you think about you know kids coming back from recess and how active they are, if you're able to dim the lights down a little bit that allows for them to kind of chill out. And then, okay, it's time for, you know, the math test or something, let's turn the lights up. So it gives you more control and improves just the, the whole learning experience in those, in those rooms. Um, and this is on the left, there's a list of some of the schools and on the right, some of the pictures of what that looks like. Um, we are typically doing fixture replacements, not uh, lamp replacements. Um, that's just a strategy we've, taken it also allows us to use our bond funds. We're limited and cannot use the bond funds on things that are considered maintenance activities and just swapping lights, lamps out would not qualify for our, our capital bond funding. We've also invested heavily in our building automation system. We were like three generations back on this. It was literally like green screen technology. And so we spent a uh, great guy, Josh Madison in our shop um, has been getting us to the latest version of these software. So we can, uh, the different, um, this on the, on the upper right here, that's, you know, sort of the global district level view. 
This is a building level view. And then you can actually click down on the equipment and get to an equipment level view and see what the settings are, what the temperatures are and other things like that. And you can also set a series of alerts and triggers and things like that if things are falling outside of parameters. And so this just lets us control things a lot better. And this has actually been really helpful uh, during COVID, we were able to really maximize the provision of fresh air in our buildings and the changeover of air, uh, increasing that. That did cost us some energy and some money, but it did allow us to, to heavily ventilate because we had done this, this upgrade. Um, there have been some financial incentives. I think most people here are familiar with DTE's financial incentives. Over the last three years, we've garnered almost $400,000 in rebates for uh, the building automation work, the LED lighting, high efficiency equipment replacement, and some retro commissioning that they've helped to fund. Um, and we're very excited about the Inflation Reduction Act. We don't have all the details yet, but um, we think two of our solar systems will qualify for a pretty significant uh, financial payout from the government, as well as uh, two geothermal systems that we're installing. Um, Rough value, probably maybe on the low end even, is about half a million dollars in direct payment. What's really cool about Inflation Reduction Act, they just, in a lot of ways, they took the existing 179D federal uh, energy efficiency tax credit or whatever it was called, and they opened it up to public institutions. We weren't able to grab these dollars previously because we're a non-taxable entity. So the renewable energy tax credit, the 179D, now all public institutions, cities, townships, school districts, nonprofits, churches can all directly monetize that without having to try to do some sort of third party lease back arrangement, which was never really something that looked like a good deal uh, for the school district. <clears throat> and so uh, it's a solar story. So this we're going to get into the solar here a little bit. Um, we've been working with Nova Consultants as our primary uh, engineering partner and uh, through public bidding and awards, we've uh, awarded uh, installation contracts to both Homeland Solar and to Slifco Electric. And so this is kind of the big overview. Uh, we are now the largest producer of solar energy in Washtenaw County um, with 1.35 megawatts of DC capacity. Um, I'm not aware of anything larger than that. I asked DTE to tell us what they had, but they wouldn't tell me. So I'm just going to run with this. Um, that equates to about 6% of our annual electrical consumption or saving us about $150,000 per year. Um, and what's really cool about this is our funding is, is comes in a couple buckets. We have what's called the general fund, which is our state funding allocation per pupil. And that goes, 89% of that goes to our salaries. So for teachers, my salary, uh, it also pays for maintenance, uh, cutting the lawn, plowing the snow, paying DTE. That general fund is highly restricted. Our capital fund is really flush right now with the passage of the bond. So we have a lot of money to put in solar, which we can pay for with the bond. But then the savings of $150,000 a year actually accrues in our very stretched general fund budget. So the solar not only is you know, helping us reduce our carbon footprint, it's actually saving our most pressed financial area um, significant money now. And you can see the five systems that um, are completed and operational, and then we have three that are in the final stages um, preparing to get interconnected. Uh, and we've selected SolarEdge as our uh, inverter supplier, and they come with a monitoring system, which I'm sure many people on this screen have, are familiar with. Um, and these are live links to those five systems that are up. Um, and you can see this is just kind of fun. This one on the left here, this is this is what you're looking for. This is the nice sunny day. Uh, the 27th of October was basically a cloudless day. Um, but then the 26th, the day before, was quite cloudy, and you can see the variability in the solar production uh, on the day after it peaked out over 100 uh, K and here it only got up to 60. And so you can, there's a lot of interesting lessons, uh, student opportunities for learning here um, that, that we're excited to, to explore and develop some more. 
Um, they also have um, these other views. This is the panel view. Um, so in the bottom left here, you, the, the little image over here, that's the, this is here on high school. That's the whole array. This is the panel view and you can zoom down and see actual real time production or you can go back in time. This is actually going back in time to uh, you know about 1.30 or so on this particular day. You can see panel by panel production, and you could also, if one was, for whatever reason, underperforming, it would you would be able to hide. It would be highlighted in a different color. Um, that's the that's one version of the panel view. Um, another way you can look at it, they call it the logical view. So this is not the physical layout. This is the electrical layout, if you will. So on the on the right here, you see the entire array. Each one of these verticals is a string which then ties up to, this is just a close-up of the top here. Uh, these strings all tie together here. So there's six strings coming into this one inverter here, and there's another six strings coming into this inverter, and then they're connecting to the panel here. Uh, so this is, again, useful for, you can see here, there's one panel that um, perhaps has an issue. You can see the light blue over here. That's something that we uh, would need to take a look at to see if there's some kind of an issue with that particular panel. So these are just some of the pictures. This is Pattengill. This was the first installation that we did. Um, one of the things when you get into these commercial scale kind of roof, flat roof installations, there are a lot of uh, requirements, if you will, for life safety. So you'll notice the distance here between the edge of the roof and the panel and clearances around various pieces of equipment. You'll see that throughout the next few slides where accommodations for people to safely traverse the roofs need to be taken into consideration. Uh, this is Hazley Elementary. Um, same kind of thing you can see here, there's some items. This is an exhaust fan probably for some bathrooms that may need to get serviced someday. So you have to leave a little space around there and this walking path along the edge. Uh, we also have been working with the 2030 district and uh, Bob Tinker uh, through them to kind of now that we've had some of this stuff up and running, you know, is it is it working right? Are the numbers right? Does our DTE billing compare with our inverter data? So Bob's been doing an analysis for us. And you can see here um, the we energized this system in February of 22. So in the red here, these are four billing months that we have full data for. And you can see in that period of time, we saved 63% of our kilowatt hours. So we used, you know, whatever that would be, 37% of what we had used previously in that time frame, And that equated to a 54% cost reduction. So instead of paying our normal, uh, where is it, cost per kilowatt hour? This is so complicated. I, I told myself before this I wasn't going to try to do this, so maybe I shouldn't. Oh, here we're like up 12 cents, 11 cents, 12 cents. Uh, we're actually over here at much lower rates. And this, this is beginning in February and moving into the sunny season here. So Aisley is going to do really well, and it'll be. I don't think it's going to zero out, but it's going to be a very significant portion of their electrical usage. Um, this is Ann Arbor Steam over on the north side. Um, this one actually, it's kind of cool. We Our first solar system of the last several years was actually this little 10 kW over here, which uh, students raised money from parents. And I think they got a little grant and they managed to scrape up enough money for a 10 kW system. So that that was before all of this started before we had the bond and the money and all that uh, but we basically added on to all of that and you can see uh, the 162 kw system that came behind in kind of a scale comparison and again notice you know you'd love to just blanket this thing edge to edge with solar it's like a it's like a long playing record you know you get a lot more time on the outside of the record so you really would like to, I mean, the, the area that we're not using here is significant, but again, that's a life safety uh, requirement. Uh, this is Forsyth. Um, 
this is the, the whole building and you can see the solar is basically in this area down here. Uh, and this is a little different setup. This actually has five inverters um, with looks like uh, three strings per inverter coming into it. And that, you know, that's why we use Nova because this is complicated. Like how big is the system? What's the physical layout? How do we get these strings? What inverter sizes are appropriate? So even though the Huron system and the Forsyth system are the same because of some of the physical layout constraints, um, we selected a different number of inverters. So this has five smaller inverters. Huron has the, the two larger inverters. Um, and this is Huron here. Anybody who's familiar with Huron High School knows it's like two big circles and there's a bridge across the middle that you can actually walk under. Uh, that's this area here. And that was ideal for us to do the solar system. And we did the same. Uh, Bob helped us with this. Uh, this system energized uh, quite a bit earlier. And so we have a little longer run of the data. But again, Hazley Elementary is about 55,000 square feet. Huron High School is about 410,000 square feet. So Huron High School is more than eight times larger. And it has a lot of high consuming things like pools, it has full air conditioning. Hazley does not have air conditioning currently. Um, it will be getting that, but it doesn't now. So Huron has a huge load compared to Hazley. Basically the same size system. We're saving about 4% of their electrical usage and it's financially saving us 3.7% uh, on the bills. And uh, you know, if you look at this building here, we we took this right here, right? This just this little rectangle. Look how much more roof space there is here, right? If we could get past this 150 kW net metering cap, and you know, we could do a lot more here. But we're kind of our whole program kind of sidles right up to that 150 kW AC. That's why you see the DC numbers are higher. Than 150, but these actually, once you calculate in the system losses and all these other things, these all are coming in at about 150 kW AC output. Um, in the works is Bryant Elementary. This one is installed. We're just kind of working out the last little bit of the interconnection. Uh, this is Westerman Preschool over on Boardwalk. This is in the works. This is building has two kind of big rectangles and then this connecting piece. So taking most of this one and a portion of that one. Uh, and this is Pioneer High School. Pioneer High School is again, it's huge. It's like Huron and it's hard to tell in this diagram, but this is this is the, the E wing, this is the D wing, this is the C wing, this is a three story section, the cafeteria stuff, the gym and all this. And we're just taking this little piece here. And I just thought I'd pull a different image from the drawing sets. This kind of shows how the strings go together. And so you can see the strings bringing these panels together. And then this is going out to inverter number one. So you've got string one, two, three, four strings going to inverter number one. And then you've got one, two, three strings going to inverter number two. And that's kind of how this is organized from an electrical standpoint. And that's the limit of my electrical knowledge. So don't ask me any more technical questions about that. That's about as far as I understand a lot of uh, the technical electrical details. Um, so a couple of the lessons learned, um, we had been bringing this system behind our roofing program. So we have, uh, you know, a couple million square feet of commercial roof, that stuff is not cheap. And so we want to um, invest wisely. So as prior to the solar installations, we are either doing uh, needed like end of life cycle roof replacements, or we're, uh, we're doing a lot of liquid applied membranes these days, um, which is a really cool low carbon way to uh, get another 20 years out of a, uh, an existing um, commercial roof. Um, essentially, uh, liquid applied membrane, as long as there's no wet sections in the roof, and we'll do scanning and stuff to make sure that the roof membrane is intact, patch a couple sections, and then you lay down, I'd say like a half inch by half inch fiberglass mat, if you will, and then apply several coats of this liquid membrane on top of that. And you basically got a 20 year warranted roof, and you didn't have to 
take out the insulation, throw it away, throw out the old roof membrane, all that stuff stays. And you don't have all the carbon intensity of all that new insulation, new membrane and all this stuff. And you just, you know, this liquid applied membrane has its own, you know, toxicity and things associated with it. But I'd love to study this more, but I know that it's a much lower carbon solution. And we, I'm sure many of you have seen a commercial roof tear off. It's, it's ugly business and it takes a lot of dumpsters um, and a lot of carbon. Uh, so thinking about that roofing system uh, leading up to solar, um, that sort of equipment access and safe walking pathways, that was one place we stumbled a little bit in the beginning until we got that kind of well understood with the um, OSHA folks and the Bureau of Construction Codes in Lansing. Um, interconnection is super time consuming. Um, apologies for anyone from DTE who was on this call, but it is like it is like watching a snail slowly move across a surface. I mean, it is just it's incredibly time consuming. Um, what should be pretty simple um, can take months and months. And, you know, these days with all construction stuff, supply chain is is a, is an issue. And we we just actively manage our supply chain. You know, we we call then we don't, but our contractors, we tell them, you know, I want an update. Tell me where my stuff is. When when is it coming in? And, you know, that constant sort of just calling the suppliers every week or two and they're like, okay, that inverter, is it coming in? You said it was coming November 15th. Are we still on target, you know? And then they're going to go, oh, well, you know, yeah, now it's December 15th. And, you know, you really got to actively manage supply chain because what used to just be guaranteed um, in terms of delivery just, just isn't anymore. Um, okay, so the next section of our energy thinking at AAPS is around natural gas combustion on site. Um, and one of our strategies is moving towards all electric heating and cooling systems. Um, and we are the largest user of geothermal in Washtenaw County. Uh, Skyline High School, which opened in 2009, is operating currently on a, on a geothermal system. And we're putting in two large geothermal systems at Clegg and Forsyth Middle Schools. Um, Skyline's about 380,000 square feet, and each of these middle schools is about 200,000 square feet. So we're kind of doubling our geothermal heating and cooling capacity. Um, and for those who don't you know, understand that too much, um, basically you're using electricity to push and pull heat from the earth. So in the summer, you're pushing heat into the earth, you're getting rid of your heat and putting it in the earth. And in the winter, you're pulling heat out of the earth. It's not completely you know, energy free. The, the energy you're using in a geothermal system is pumping the fluids and then all of the fans and other things associated with the different pieces of equipment uh, to move air. But uh, it is a way to go essentially electric with your heating and cooling system without, um, you know, with a, with a new system. So we're very excited about that. Uh, we thank the neighbors to both of those schools that had to put up with drill rigs and they're essentially in their backyards for uh, most of the summer. Um, and this looks something like this. This, these are four drilling rigs. These wells go down about 450 feet. Um, you can see the layout of the wells here. This is Clegg Middle School. So the, the field is back here, kind of around the softball diamond. Um, and there are houses and condos and stuff around here. But um, it takes about a day to do one of those wells. With Each rig can do one well per day, essentially. They drill the well, and then they have to drop the pipe in. And then they grout it with uh, a special clay mixture that it and that uh, helps with heat transfer with the earth. What's that special mixture? That's what's in these. That's what's in these uh, pallets over here is that clay mixture. Um, so all the drilling's done. Now we're now we're bringing it back to the buildings, and uh, next summer we'll we'll uh, energize the system uh, and tie it fully into the buildings. Uh, purchased electricity. This is our scope uh, two emissions. Um, I imagine most people here are familiar with a diagram like this, but scope two emissions are those indirect emissions associated with purchased electricity, most commonly, uh, well, per any kind of purchased 
energy, but generally uh, purchased electricity. Scope one is your direct emissions. So those fossil fuels associated with uh, burning natural gas or bus diesel, those kinds of things. And then scope three is kind of everything else, your purchased services, your purchased goods, um, waste management, business travel, and some other things. Um, and so there's just a picture of, I think that might be the Monroe power plant, I'm not sure, one of DTE's power plants. Um, and, and scope two is something that, uh, you know, we're thankful for a great partnership with DTE to help us with that. So we signed a renewable energy contract for 20 years with DTE Energy. And by 2024, we will have eliminated all scope two emissions. Um, and with our commitment, DTE is currently in the process of building new renewable energy infrastructure in Michigan, likely wind farms, but perhaps some solar farms also. And the renewable energy credits from those installations will be provided to the school district. Um, we will be the first major institution in the county to eliminate scope two emissions. Um, so you can see here in this little breakdown, we think our total annual consumption is roughly 30,000 megawatt hours. And based on the renewable portfolio standard, 15% of that will be from renewable sources already. Uh, we've got 6% coming from our own solar and we're gonna be doing more solar, this will go up. And then the migraine power purchase fills in 80% more renewable energy to get us into essentially carbon okay. positive space with okay. our uh, purchased electricity. His name's Emil. This is just what it kind of looks like. Um, Louisa, this is a DTE wind farm and a DTE solar farm. And so this is um, kind of how this looks over time. The bottom here is time and uh, going up and down is our carbon. And you can see uh, here is where our first rooftop solar array went in. And we are slowly coming down as we bring those online. Uh, with the Michigan Green Power Purchase, we will actually then move into a carbon positive uh, space. And then as we do additional solars, we will move further into the carbon positive space for our scope two emissions. Um, and you know, everybody likes these equivalencies. Um, the elimination of these scope two emissions are equal to 32 million miles driven by an average car or uh, the burning of 14 million pounds of coal. Um, so that's not a small amount of um, emissions. On uh, waste reduction, uh, we partnered with Eagle right before COVID. We were rolling this thing out. It really hurt that uh, we had all of our stuff lined up and then COVID happened, but we got all new classroom recycling infrastructure, uh, hallway containers and posters. Um, and our current estimated diversion rate is 28.6%. And this is kind of a chart that looks at that by location. Unfortunately, we don't have any way to measure the actual volume or weight of recycling or trash, but we do have recycling and trash dumpsters at all of our locations. Uh, based on how often those are emptied, um, we generate approximately 30,000 cubic yards of trash and send about 12,000 cubic yards uh, for recycling, giving us a diversion rate of approximately 28%. We're also working on um, construction uh, waste management. Um, steel, uh, you know, that's been going on for years. There's money in that, but we're certainly doing that. The thing that's um, kind of innovative that we're getting into because we're doing a lot of ceiling and lights. So we're generating a lot of ceiling tile and through Armstrong Worldwide, uh, we've been basically stockpiling ceiling tiles. And once we get enough ceiling tiles to fill up a semi truck, they will actually come pick it up for free and take it back to their plant and reprocess it into the new ceiling tiles. Um, and then the ceiling tiles that we're purchasing have also recycled content from that, that same program. Um, transportation, this is our transportation yard down by the tracks here. You can see our transportation building here, um, the sort of auxiliary bus lot and the main bus lot. We have 132 buses and recently 
purchased four electric buses through the Volkswagen settlement dollars. Um, and those buses now currently, this is probably an old aerial photograph, but there's four buses that park here close near the building that are in that um, uh, getting charged and everything. Um, so once these are fully operational, we are we are having some performance um, issues with these buses, and we're thankful that our partners aren't just ditching us and they're working with us on resolving that. Um, this will also be one of the first vehicles to grid interconnections once we get everything sorted out. Um, and you can see these this chart. Um, this is our uh, our enrollment, the bus miles driven per year. The yellow are just some estimates where we have some gaps in our data. Uh, miles driven per student, annual diesel consumption, um, our miles per gallon you can see is kind of headed in the right direction. We we're kind of in the mid fives here and now we're getting up around eight and seven. And then the diesel consumed per student um, is also trending in the right direction. Uh, COVID is just like, it's just whack, whack these whole, all of this out. So it's really hard to tell, but you, you can see that the diesel per student, for instance, was trending in the right direction and COVID hit. I mean, we were only open for a couple months in 2021 uh, in the spring. So we had almost no busing that year. 2022, we took a little bit off the end with COVID starting in March. So um, that's just a little anomaly in the data, but it does seem to be trending in the right direction. Um, and, you know, scope three emissions, um, you know, I hear a lot of people saying, oh, we're gonna be carbon neutral by X and X date. What they're not telling you is that they're probably not talking about scope three emissions. Um, and as I mentioned, when we were getting ready for this meeting, that is kind of, in my mind, it's kind of the elephant in the room. It's all of these purchased goods and services. Um, this on the left is a, an investment firm looking at their industrial clients around the world. Um, they're estimating, and these are manufacturing facilities and whatnot. This is their scope one and two emissions. This is their scope three emissions, right? So just think about that for a second. We're gonna spend all this time on scope one and two. We're gonna do solar, we're gonna electrify, we're gonna do all this other stuff but that scope three stuff is still gonna be there. So that's a, really something for us to think about. And they break scope three kind of into upstream and downstream. Again, this is from a sort of industrial manufacturing uh, standpoint. Um, on, the, on the right here, this is Yale University, looking at their scope one, two, and three. At the top here, you can see their scope one emissions, that's the direct emissions on campus. Their scope two emissions, I believe they've been phasing into a green power purchase arrangement. That's why that's pretty low. But their scope three emissions is the largest bucket of all of their emissions. And when they broke down their scope three emissions, you've got purchase goods and services, uh, fuel and energy related activities, capital goods, that would be construction materials and the like, employee commuting, and then a very small scope three associated with waste and business travel. So that's a, that's a big piece right there, that scope three piece. Um, and it's not easy to tackle and there are very uh, rudimentary tools at this point even to calculate it. Um, so on the right, you'll see kind of all of those activities that contribute to scope three. A Couple of things that we've been working on, um, working, uh, Jan Culbertson and others have formed a low embodied carbon task force, concrete, I'm sorry, that should say concrete right there, um, low embodied concrete task force, looking at how to make uh, concrete mixes that are lower carbon. And we've been piloting some of that for some sidewalks and things like that. And it's looking pretty good. Um, one of the issues with the lower carbon concrete is it takes longer to cure. Uh, so if you're on a tight construction timeline and if you need to do things like footings, uh, you know, you might, you know, it's going to add a couple of weeks to your schedule and those couple of weeks are money and that makes that a difficult choice. But for sidewalks in particular, we felt that that was something we could start doing. Um, I mentioned before the construction 
waste and uh, new construction. And I'm not going to get too far into this tonight, but um, we are planning two new schools uh, to replace the pathways uh, school building on Stone School and Mitchell School um, in the Southeast Ann Arbor. And those will be um, using lower embodied carbon building systems, and they will be planned as all electric schools with no natural gas service to them. So we're really excited about that. Those would be occupancy in 2026. Uh, we've been doing some work with stormwater. As we go through our paving, you know, we need to periodically reconstruct paving parking lots. And so as we go, we've been putting in things like this is a a bioswale at Pioneer that captures about 70% of the water from this parking lot over here. Uh, this is a similar system at Scarlet. Um, they, they, they help filter the water, retain it a little bit, and really provide nice natural visual features. Um, and anybody who's familiar with Pioneer, we're really proud of this. That this this was just the the walk of shame up to this building. I mean, it was nothing. It was just grass, um, and we really invested in creating like a public space and I'll see students gathered out there protests start there and you know it's just a nice place it's a place to be not a place to walk through and that that's a strategy we've been using at all of our schools also um, as we do parking lots is trying to work on those front entrances and make them much more much more inviting uh, water quality um, and conservation uh, due in part to COVID, but also for water conservation, we've converted everything to touchless operation. Um, that saves a lot of water. It also um, reduces disease transmission. Uh, we have a long-standing irrigation policy. Basically, we don't irrigate except for high school athletic fields. So none of our grass or any flower beds or anything like that is irrigated. Um, uh, it's funny when whenever we work with a new landscape architect, they always ask us about irrigation and I tell them no and they say well are you sure it's going to be so hard um, but we just don't do it um, and then we're working with the city of Ann Arbor and 2030 district to get uh, fully hooked up to the Aquahawk water metering software which would in theory give us uh, alerts and things like that once we get it working uh, for our water meters and um, I won't read all this but we have a a really an outstanding water quality program. We've spent a lot of time working on this. Um, we've installed water bottle filling stations with lead filters at all of our buildings. Um, and uh, it's just, a, it's a big program with a lot of testing and with public reporting and, and the like. Um, outdoor environment, we've been doing some really fun stuff. Uh, we did a massive uh, tree planting program a couple years ago. Um, so you can see some of the kids helping in this middle slide, plant some trees, and I was just there, these girls, this was their favorite one. I think we planted 15 trees, and they were very proud to tell me this was their favorite of the 15 trees. Um, and we, this is Pat and Gill's baseball field. And, um, you know, one of the things we looked at is, you know, climate change and these trees. If these are 100-year-plus trees, um, there's going to be a lot of changes to our climate, and this is this is projected essentially in that time frame. what species are going to be primarily living or able to live in our area. And so we selected um, native and native adaptive species, um, trying to stay out of the, the, the species that were kind of on the cusp of getting to a place where it was too warm for them. So we actually were pulling trees either where we are kind of in the middle of their habitat zone or pulling to the south a little bit, anticipating that some of the trees from the south would actually do better here in a climate change uh, future. And really a big part of that was just providing shade in our playgrounds. They do get pretty cooking and there aren't a lot of trees. And so that was kind of the, the one of the big things. Um, and, and also carbon sequestration and beautification and the like. And so these are just, these are not the trees we planted. This is what they will look like in 50 years. Um, but some of the species here. Another thing we've been piloting is a NOMO strategy. Um, so we, uh, for those who aren't familiar, we um, uh, 
took back uh, a lease school building on the, in the northwest part of town out Dixboro Road, and I've been uh, turning that into the Freeman Environmental Education Center. Um, there's this grass area here, and then there's another 20 acres of woods to the north. And this stall was mowed when we took the building back, and we decided to try a no mow pilot. So um, these areas that are kind of discolored here, all of that is essentially only mowed once every two years. Uh, we do that because little trees and things, buckthorn start to grow up. Um, but essentially, we it's this is in kind of year one, what that looks like, and this is, you know, in year three, getting a little more mature. This is this is just basically turf grass here in year one coming up, but you can see other things are starting to make their way into this area in, in year three. And so we've done a kind of a rough calculation of carbon sequestration from our land. Um, this is something that is, I'm looking for resources that can help us get a little more exact around this, but um, our estimate is that our, uh, Turf grass areas, wooded areas, and ponds sequester approximately 3,000 tons of CO2 annually. And that's based on certain assumptions you see here in the bottom. One acre of grass sequestering 1.8 tons, one acre of average forest, uh, four tons, and one acre of pond, which I was really surprised to hear this, um, sequesters 80 tons of CO2 a year. Um, and so you can see Thurston Elementary School here, which has a significant pond, is one of our leaders in carbon sequestration. Um, Pioneer High School does have 177 acres, and Skyline High School has a whole lot of woodlot associated with it that's contributing to uh, their high sequestration numbers. And then someplace like Community High School, I mean, it's in the city, there's not a lot of land, there's a few trees and a little bit of grass, is you know not really contributing as much to that sequestration. Another uh, thing that we've done that I'm, I'm really proud of, um, we had to replace three of our athletic turf fields uh, at Pioneer, Skyline, and Huron High School, the main stadium uh, turf field. And usually in this cross section, the, there's the shock pad. And then these green fibers actually go all the way down through this whole matrix. So those fibers are about two and a quarter to two and a half inches long. Um, typically, this entire section would be filled with crumb rubber. So these tires containing arsenic, benzene, heavy metals, lead, and mercury, this would be all chopped up tires with off-gassing associated with them. Um, in this geofield fill system, uh, the, the bottom half of this, the profile is filled with sand. Again, these green fibers go all the way down here. And then the coconut fiber, uh, tops it off and gives it almost an earth-like kind of a sense. Um, and that ends up looking something like that. If you were to go on the field, you wouldn't really be able to tell much of a difference other than, you know, if you were to make a quick turn or something like that, you, you see in pro sports, the, the black stuff shoots up. That's all that crumb rubber. In this case, the coconut fiber would be, you know, kind of coming out of the turf, if you will. Um, maintenance is really the same. You know, you, you kind of rake it out every once in a while, every two or three years, you top it off. Um, and these fields last, if they're well-maintained, eight to 12 years. I have mail. I don't want to interrupt too much. I just want to make sure we leave a few minutes for questions. Just oh, in my, case. am I talking so, to you? I'm no, you're, you're, you're okay. I'm just kind oh, of giving hey, you Julie, a 10 minutes. Look at, Julie, look at this. What's that? The last slide. <laughs> All right, cool. Thanks. All right, I'll I'll stop my stop share here. I didn't mean to cut you off. I was no, I that's, all right. that's all right. Oh, that's funny. Um, wow, thank you so much. There was a lot there, and I am I for one. I don't know how everybody else feels, but I really enjoy hearing about all the big picture of what Anna Republic Schools is doing, solar and everything else. I was especially excited to hear about the um the uh construction waste um mm -hmm. that you're working on because you know that when you think about scope three emissions and you think about a circular economy people think about a circular economy in terms of reuse and recycle but the truth is you know if, first off 
you know, using roofing material that can go over so you don't, you don't have to even buy upstream and therefore you're not responsible for the carbon that that requires. And then mm -hmm. what you do with your roofing materials when you, when it leaves the building, this stuff isn't as sexy as solar, but it is really, really important in the mm -hmm. big picture. So thank you um, for, uh, you know, for including that in your presentation, and but more so for including it in your, in the, you know, all that you're doing uh, with the Ann Arbor Public Schools. I really appreciate that. But I think now I'm going to try to figure out how to see people. And if people have questions, please raise your virtual hand. I can't, I don't think I'll see you if you wait, raise your actual hand. I can try or just pop off mute and ask questions of Emil. Now's your chance. Mark Cleavy. Thank you very much. Um, Emil, I, uh, I got a couple of questions, but I'll just ask one and then I'll come back around and get the other one later. Um, I was wondering with the um, EV chargers on the, the, the EV buses, if you're going to power them with distributed power that you're generating from your solar or DTE's migraine power or DTE's frack gas and coal. So, um, you know, electrons are like water, you know, they go to wherever they're going to go. So, um, you know, by 2024, we will be purchasing 80% of our electricity through a renewable energy credit system. We'll have another 15% through um, the portfolio standard and then 6% from, uh, you know, our own solar generation. Um, we don't currently have any solar at the transportation hub, so that would they would be charged from the grid electricity. And is that the My Green Power Program? Correct. Correct. Um, so that I'll ask the follow up now. Then, so uh, Ann Arbor Public School, all, all public schools get a special rate from the utilities. Um, uh, right now, the My Green Power and the fossil fuel um, costs are the same. Um, it's just sort of a, a quirk in the way that, that the, everything's worked around and it's now cost the same. So basically my green power is less expensive than it has been and there's no premium test to it. Do, does Ann Arbor Public Schools get a benefit from that because the my green power is now less expensive or at least equal to fossil fuels or, or not? Yeah, the, we're, we're participating in the, in, in, and it's a little different than the customer my green power, which okay. I signed up for. We're in the yeah. large customer migraine power program. Okay. Where, okay. Uh, basically, the contract um, we we pay, uh, and uh, don't quote me, we pay an X amount of fee per megawatt hour, and then we receive a credit from the sale of the renewable energy in the the meso market or whatever the the electricity market is, and right. then that that fee and the credit come together. And we actually see a net savings over the first 10 years. Great. Excellent. Thank you. That is great. Um, I'm going to go to Fabrice. And then after Fabrice, I'm going to read a, a question from the chat. Great. Hey, Emil. Uh, this is Fabrice. I am an inaugural member of the new Sustainability Committee of Troy School District in awesome. Oakland County. So uh, very inspiring to see what's going on in Washtenaw and uh, hoping to bring some of that over here. I guess um, two questions. One is we're locked into uh, an energy contract with this uh, consulting firm, Executive Energy, um, to which is gonna guarantee us 40% renewable energy over like 10 years. So mm -hmm. I guess less than the uh, than your direct contract with, uh, with uh, DEW, DTE. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts about those types of contracts and ways to get around them or, or ideas. The other thing is for school buses, I've been told, you know, maybe partly from your experience, lack of reliability. So mm -hmm. a reluctance for our school district to go ahead and purchase electric buses because of concerns about reliability. Uh, you mentioned that a little bit. Could you expand on that? Yeah, sure. Um, as far as your contract, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know, I've seen some pretty, uh, I don't know this company and I don't know the contract, but I have just in my days seen some in retrospect that people kind of regret getting into. Um, but on, on the buses, um, 
I would encourage you guys to do kind of, kind of, we, we did four, you know, to start, which is a four out of 132. So it's, if those four go out of service a little bit, you know, that's manageable for us. Um, you know, I, I, in the recent announcements, um, I see some school districts are, you know, they're getting like a third to a half of their buses through these new purchases, which is great. I would just be concerned about reliability. Um, I, I think it's coming along pretty quickly. And, I, and I, you know, I think, you know, Ann Arbor Public Schools is going to take a hard look at the next round and in increasing our, uh, you know, getting some more electric buses. Um, but, you know, we're, we were some of the first hoaxer electric buses to come off the line. I mean, like in the first, you know, 20 or something. And, you know, the Proterra, I mean, we're practically the guinea pig with this charging stuff. So, you know, once this stuff gets worked out, you know, I think it's going to be uh, very reliable. Um, and I'd encourage you guys to look at, you know, just pick up one or two just so the transportation folks get familiar with it. The drive, One of the hurdles we've had is the drivers, you know, need to get comfortable with it. It's a whole different experience, you know, somebody who's driven an EV like that, you don't hear the engine, you know, so it's like, is it on, is it off? I don't know. So just getting one or two to kind of get people familiar would be something to think about. Great. That's good. That makes a lot of sense. And I'm going to read one in the uh, chat here from Joe Lutz, because he put it in the chat. You can speak up too, but it says, I teach for Grand Haven schools. We are planning a new middle school in the next few years. I'm wondering about cost versus long-term savings of these initiatives. Would love to have resources to share with my district to get them to consider green options in the construction planning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's an age-old debate. Um, you talk to some people and they'll say green buildings are actually cheaper if you do it right. And part of the way you do that is using uh, what's known as an integrated or integrative design process. Um, most typically, that type of construction, you know, the architect goes off in some corner somewhere and draws something up and then they bring it out and they show it to the mechanical, electrical, structural guys. And then they just got to figure out what they're doing with that. If you use an integrative design process where you have your MEP engineers and all those folks, landscape site people at the table in the beginning, you can do things in that process that will make the building operate much more efficiently. Uh, one of the things that the MEP folks are going to say want is they want a, an efficient building envelope, right? So, uh, you know, the most efficient enclosure in geometry is a sphere. You you contain more space with a sphere, with less surface area than any other geometry. In buildings, if you make a three-story cube, that's going to have a lot less exterior surface than if you take those three stories and spread them out and put them next to each other. You just really increase the inefficiency of the building by doing that. So using an integrative design process, you can get those building efficiencies. Plus, um, you can eliminate a lot of, if it's done well, you can eliminate a lot of the change orders and other uh, things that can happen when you don't have a coordinated construction team. You know, you literally, you end up with, hey, my pipe is going through your duct because we didn't talk to each other. Or, you know, you put a window, but wait, <laughs> this is going in front of your window. Now we need to spend more money. So uh, I'd encourage you to look at, um, we're using uh, chips for our, uh, a lot of people are familiar with LEED. Uh, chips is the Coalition for High Performance Schools. It's also a green building rating system. And one of the things we like about it uh, with the Coalition for High Performance Schools is it's really designed for the K-12 community. And it has a lot of things in it about, um, you know, how you build uh, the team that's going to manage the building well at the end, how you focus in on those student health and student outcomes that I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation and, and getting into a lot of that kind of stuff. So um, I'd encourage you to, to people are going to say it's going to cost more, um, but uh, there are ways to, to bring it in at, at a very equal cost um, with that, you know, and you don't want to, there's a lot of technology out there and there's a lot of stuff that maybe is a little too expensive um, now, but it'll come down and maybe there's something else you substitute in the, in the interim. Perfect. And we are, 
at time, but I'm going to let John Sarver have the last question and stay on for two more minutes to let him get it in. All right. Yeah, this might be a simple one. Uh, you know, assuming you had enough money, would you put a geothermal uh, heating and cooling system at every building, or are there some buildings where it wouldn't be a good application? You know, I can't think of one where, I mean, the other electric sort of option that's viable for this scale is, is air source heat pumps. Um, you know, and we have looked at that. Um, and that's one of those technologies that in the last even just five years has come a long way. Uh, five years ago, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who was really confident about air source heat pumps in a northern climate. Um, but the technology has improved a lot. Um, really, the only limitation on geothermal that that we may run into is available space for the well field. But, um, you know, we... I can't think of one where there isn't, you know, maybe community high school might be a little tight. Um, you know, there's not a lot of space there in the back in the parking lot. But um, other than that, it's really, you just need the space and it's, it's a great way to go. Perfect. Thank you so much, Emil, for coming here and sharing this video. And this is gonna be recorded, it's being recorded and it'll be on the GLREA YouTube. So if folks know other people who are interested in what the public schools are doing, you know, feel free to share this out. And I think Emil is gonna send slides in. So if you're interested in those, you can probably contact John um, and the GLREA team. And I am gonna go back out into my little desert landscape now with my, <laughs> with my off grid brother who lives at least 30 minutes away from another human. <laughs> and uh, wish you all a great night, Emil. Thank you, GLREA, thank you. And everyone have a great evening. All right, thank you.